Is it the E-Tank or this all-electric infantry escort vehicle? Or hybrid transmissions? What will be the future tech in the next generation of combat vehicles? It's a necessity rather than a, an ambition to be able to move away from fossil fuel. One thing is clear, this is not the top military priority for the German Bundeswehr or the U.S. Army. We take a critical look at the technology that could still make it work. Battle tanks are real gas guzzlers. The Leopard 2 weighs more than 60 tons and consumes up to 530 liters of diesel per 100 kilometers. The US Abrams M1A1 tank runs on kerosene and consumes up to 700 liters per 100 kilometers. The development times for military vehicles are very long. The Leopard 2 took about nine years. Its successor is currently being developed as part of a Franco-German project and will be in service by 2040 at the earliest. The systems that will power European tanks in the second half of this century are being decided today. But how can military vehicles be made climate neutral? Is going electric the solution? We are at the Euro Satori 2024, an arms fair in Paris. Purely electric-powered vehicles are a rarity here. This is Artis. Artis has four-wheel drive and can transport 200 kilograms of cargo through rough terrain, for example, ammunition or wounded soldiers. Artis can be charged inductively and is fully charged again in one hour. The battery lasts for four hours at full throttle. The French arms company, Arcus, is also showing a similar prototype. The trailer can transport 700 kilograms of cargo, such as a cannon. It travels without a driver as a robotic vehicle. According to the manufacturer, it takes six hours to charge. However, the vehicle also has a combustion engine on board, which increases its range. Manufacturers are skeptical about all electric vehicles. All electric is unthinkable for a simple reason. If you want the same range from a 25-ton vehicle using batteries, you'd have to carry 15 tons of batteries. So you can imagine a vehicle like the Griffon adding another 15 tons to the vehicle to get the same range. It's unthinkable. There are light, medium and heavy vehicles. And in the light vehicle sector, electrification using a battery is in principle entirely conceivable. Kosten Pinkfahrt conducts research into the energy supply of the German armed forces for the German Ministry of Defense, among others. Now, when it comes to the hybridization of medium vehicles or even heavy vehicles, I don't see any new technology on the horizon. Nevertheless, the hybrid system is still being considered for heavy vehicles. General Dynamics published images of a prototype with a hybrid engine in 2022, the Abrams X. This tank from Rheinmetall is the basis for a development contract with the U.S. Army. Together with partners, the group's U.S. subsidiary is developing a potential successor to the Bradley fighting vehicle. It is powered by this hybrid transmission which is integrated with a 220 kilowatt electric motor. Excess power from the combustion engine is converted into electricity and stored in a battery. There is no plan to charge the future tank via a socket. The mild hybrid capability gives us the ability to blend what we call torque blending, to blend and utilize both the mechanical transmission at the same time as we're using the electric transmission. So you can reduce the amount of uh, mechanical force required by augmenting it from the electric side. So you can reduce your fuel consumption uh, by, by blending both the electric motor capability with the mechanical uh, transmission capability um, to move the vehicle. We can reduce fuel consumption by up to 50% on certain engines. The German company Renk is presenting a new hybrid transmission concept with an integrated 300 kilowatt electric motor. The transmission is designed for vehicles weighing 50 to 70 tons. 
Decarbonization. I think the next step the armies will go now is hybrid. That's the trend we're seeing worldwide among the major players. However, combustion engines are still the main source of power, even with the hybrid concept. So how can these engines run in a climate-neutral way? This off-road vehicle at the Eurosatory Arms Fair is climate-neutral. It's not the car that's new, but the fuel. The prototype runs on synthetic fuel, a so-called e-fuel. As an experienced driver, I was a bit biased, but in the end I realized that this engine burns e-fuel more efficiently than normal diesel. In other words, my vehicle is a little more sprightly, more responsive. But where does the synthetic fuel come from? We are in Frankfurt am Main, in the Höchst Industrial Park. This is where the startup company Ineritech is building a pilot plant for e-fuels. The plant receives carbon dioxide from an on-site biogas plant via these pipes. The hydrogen also comes from on-site. It's obtained as a byproduct of a process using electricity. If the electricity comes from renewable sources, then the hydrogen is also green. The synthetic fuel will soon be produced in these three 20-foot containers. In the first step, carbon dioxide and hydrogen are fed into a reverse shift reactor. There, synthesis gas, known as syngas, a mixture of carbon monoxide, hydrogen and water, is produced at high temperatures and under pressure. After the water has been separated, the synthesis gas is fed into a fischer tropsch reactor. There, the gases react to a catalyst to form liquid hydrocarbons. This substance flows into a cooled container where water, gas and other hydrocarbons are separated. Different hydrocarbons with different chain lengths are produced. Solid waxes and liquid oils. These hydrocarbons can be further processed chemically into paints and varnishes paint thinners, fuels, and solvents. In reality, the reverse shift reactor looks like this. Hydrogen and carbon dioxide flow into the reactor on the left, and the synthesis gas comes out on the right. So actually, this is a heat exchanger and a chemical reactor um, all together. Very compact, very complex, and uh, a very unique uh, technology we have here. The fischer trope reactors are located on the other side of the container plant. The company is investing 30 million euros in the plant, of which 8 million euros are subsidies. The production facility is expected to produce a maximum of 2,500 tons of e-fuels per year. According to the founder, the demand is there. We are currently actually investigating with a partner uh, how the future applications of our e-fuel synthesis plants could look like and how our, our technology could contribute to helping the defense sector also to achieving their climate goals in the future. Back to the arms fair in Paris. The German company Rheinmetall is exhibiting a container from its partner in Aerotech. The container is part of a concept for a war-ready fuel supply system. Shana Britzen, head of Rheinmetall Hydrogen, developed the concept. The military itself is to produce synthetic fuel, decentralized and distributed across all European NATO countries, from renewable energy, water and carbon dioxide. NATO is buying that fuel off the normal market and is assuming that um, also in, in, in wartime, that supply will work and the supply chains will work. Um, we see this as a luxury and Ukraine, the conflict in Ukraine, has told us that this kind of luxury is critical in war times um, because relying on those supply chains um, is critical. Uh, and hence, um, looking into technology that is available today, that is ready to scale, um, there's, uh, there are other opportunities um, now opening up to become war-ready for large-scale 
defend of the homeland, uh, defense of the homeland, um, using synthetic fuels. Rheinmetall is now looking for a customer to order the prototype system and test it in a military environment. E-fuels could therefore be available in just a few years' time. In the more distant future, however, hydrogen could also be used to power military vehicles. Truck manufacturers such as Daimler Truck are currently testing these types of systems. They rely on fuel cells that produce electricity. The vehicle is powered by electric motors. Here's how the fuel cell works. Hydrogen is fed into one side of a cell divided by a membrane. Oxygen is fed into the other side. The oxygen slips through the membrane and this process releases electrical energy. The molecules then combine to form water. There are no moving parts. There is no noise pollution. I don't have any thermal output because a fuel cell like this runs at low temperatures, at 180, 120 degrees, depending on what kind of system I have, and I only have water dripping out the back of the exhaust pipe. In the event of war, the vehicles would therefore be more difficult to locate. Logistically, any change to the existing system is a challenge. It's about having the energy available where it's needed. And that is not easy with hydrogen. The energy density compared to uh, hydrocarbons and the complexity in the tank and logistics systems is so huge that from our perspective we'll never see this in, in broad scale implementation because it just makes logistics com more complex in the armed forces. In short, the only way for military land vehicles to quickly become climate neutral is to use synthetic fuels. However, NATO has not yet agreed on the specifications for such a fuel. Manufacturers therefore do not yet know how they need to adapt their combustion engines. Nevertheless, the German military needs to be climate neutral by 2045. Mind you, everything has to be converted by 2045. Hans-Jochen Luhmann is a senior expert on climate policy at the Wuppertal Institute. There is no clear commitment that, yes, we only buy and order vehicles that are capable of running on climate-neutral fuels by 2045. Otherwise, that's money out the window. European defense companies must also be climate-neutral by 2050 at the latest under the EU climate law. This explicitly includes the products they sell, the so-called scope three emissions. Scope three, we will probably achieve towards the closer to 2050 than some industries because of that fact of having to trial and test and not compromise. Deborah Allen is chair of the climate task force of the European Space and Defense Industries Association. I think recognizing the longevity of defense platforms, that they're in operation for 30, 40 years. It's imperative that anything that's being designed now is taking this into account and planning for that fuel transition. The path to climate neutral military land vehicles is not yet 100% clear. If it's not possible to convert all vehicles in such a way that no greenhouse gases are released, the only way forward may be through compensation projects, such as reforestation. What are your thoughts on this topic? <laughs>